Hello, welcome to all. In the previous lecture, uh, we studied the construction and working of the ballistic galvanometer. Okay, uh, in this lecture also we continue the ballistic galvanometer. Okay, the outline of today's lecture is Yeah, you can see here, uh, we studied the conditions to be fulfilled by the ballistic galvanometer, that means galvanometer to be ballistic. Next, uh, we will study <coughs> the uses of ballistic galvanometer. We already know the primary use of the ballistic galvanometer. Next, uh, we study about the sensitivity of ballistic galvanometer, whether it may be charge sensitivity or current sensitivity okay after that we will be going for the galvanometer damping okay uh, in this uh, we also study about the technical terms or the definitions of decrement and logarithmic decrement finally we will do the damping correction of the ballistic galvanometer so that we can get the charge flowing through the meter in a correct manner in a correct manner by using the formula derived in the previous lecture okay okay what are the conditions it has to fulfill okay a galvanometer has to fulfill to behave like a ballistic galvanometer okay you can see these conditions on the slide as well. Okay, what are the conditions? There are uh, three conditions. Okay, first conditions of the ballistic galvanometer. Okay, so what conditions it has to fulfill to be a ballistic galvanometer? Okay, here. The time period of this ballistic galvanometer, the time period of the ballistic galvanometer T should be large. One thing is it should be large. Okay. We have to see that the T of the galvanometer is large. Okay. In how many ways this can be achieved? For this, what you have to do? You have to increase the moment of inertia of the coil. You have to increase the moment of inertia of the coil. Okay, in order to increase the uh, periodic time. Okay, because you know that uh, formula of time period T is equal to two pi under root C i by C double. Okay, C per unit press this thing. Yeah. So, in order to have the large time period, what you have to do, you have to increase i. You have to increase i, i moment of inertia of the coil. Okay. Right. Next, that means uh, you have to take, uh, you may increase i by increasing the mass or the distribution of the mass. Okay. Next. Uh, Apart from that, what you have to do, you may increase this uh, T, yeah, by this, uh, by decreasing the torsional rigidity, okay, torsional rigidity of the, the torsional rigidity of the uh, coil, okay, or the oscillator, okay. This can be given by this uh, C characterized by C. By decreasing this, we can increase the T value as well. For that, what we are doing is we are tying the, we are hanging the rectangular uh, coil to a phosphor branch wire. The purpose of using the phosphor branch wire is to decrease this uh, C or the torsional rigidity of the oscillator. Okay, for that purpose only we are using a special uh, wire that is passport bronze wire. Okay, 
right so this will increase the time period okay what is the mean for increasing the time period we will see later next what are the other conditions to be fulfilled by this galvanometer to be ballistic damping should be negligibly small we will discuss in detail about this galvanometer damping later yeah what is damping damping means uh, offering some obstruction for the coil here that means opposing or trying to halt the rotation of the not coil rectangular coil okay damping see what factors are slowing down this rotation of the coil there are, there are some mechanical means mechanical causes are there next due to induced current okay induced current is one thing so when electrical means uh, you can electrical factors also uh, damp the motion of the coil as well as mechanical factors also damp the motion rotatory motion of the coil okay what we have to uh, do here is we have to see that this damping which however uh, actually in fact it is not possible to make it zero that means these two factors we cannot avoid uh, these two factors of uh, of uh, providing damping for the rotating coil but we can minimize we can safely minimize uh, these factors that means we have to see that the air resistance between the coil and air is uh, small and you have to see that there is a, a minimum induced current in the coil for that purpose what you have to do here you have to take non conducting frames for making the rectangular coil or non conducting core like ivory you have to use ivory or bamboo hmm, as a core materials or uh, as frames okay you have to use the frames of those such type of materials okay? this will avoid the eddy currents across the cross section of the frame or the core okay right next uh, what other things here it has to obey your galvanometer has to fulfill that is here the transient current should be as fast that it should go through the meter before the coil start rotating okay the entire current has passed through the instrument before the coil just starts to uh, rotate okay yeah how this can be achieved how this third thing can be achieved you may just uh, increase the time period that's why uh, we studied this as the first condition always you have to keep the time period fairly large so that so that the entire current passed through the passed through the meter okay before it starts swinging before it starts to, it starts to swing okay this time period should be very long for that purpose what we have to do we have already discussed about those things yeah okay so every galvanometer has to fulfill these three conditions in order to be a ballistic galvanometer okay right next we are already discussing about the primary use of this ballistic galvanometer okay all of us know that we use this ballistic galvanometer primarily to measure the charges flowing over a very short period of time okay transient charge okay or or it may yeah apart from this it can be used for uh, 
different purposes. You just see on the slide, this can be used to compare the EMFs of the given two cells. Okay, EMFs. Next, this can be used to find the self inductance and mutual inductance of the coils. Okay. Next, to compare the capacitances of the capacitors, this can be used to compare the capacitances of the given two capacitors, capacitances of the given two capacitors. Uh, next, it, uh, it, uh, it can be used to find the angle of dip at one particular place on the earth. Okay. It is related to the magnetism. Next, it can also be used to find the high resistance through leakage method. Okay, leakage of charge through capacitor. Okay, right. So, apart from using the ballistic galvanometer for measuring the transient charge, it can also be used for these different uh, purposes. Okay, these are the other uses, auxiliary uses of this ballistic galvanometer. Okay, which we have to know. Next, let us go for the sensitivity. Next, let us go for the sensitivity of the ballistic galvanometer. Sensitivity of the ballistic galvanometer. Yeah. Here, the question of sensitivity does not arise only in the case of ballistic galvanometer. It arises in case of any instrument. Any instrument. See, along with this sensitivity, we also discuss the accuracy of the instrument. Okay. Accuracy. We will also discuss about the precision of the instruments. But these are all uh, not the same. Okay, but there is a slight difference between all these things. Okay, here we need not to confuse with the accuracy and sensitivity, hmm? uh, precision and sensitivity. Okay, these are all the different things. There are there are some minute differences between all these terms. Yeah, but particularly here we are discussing about the sensitivity of this uh, uh, ballistic uh, galvanometer. There are uh, so many types of sensitivities. Sensitivities. Actually, what is the general uh, definition of sensitivity? General definition of uh, sensitivity. Okay, this is a change uh, in the output for the change in the measurable quantity. Say, here, if you take current as a quantity, physical quantity. Then our charge is a physical quantity. You take the charge, okay, that uh, you want to measure by using this uh, ballistic galvanometer. For that purpose, you are taking the deflection readings, okay. See, you are observing that for how much change in this theta, how much change in uh, this charge is taking place. Okay? This is called uh, the charge sensitivity of the galvanometer charge sensitivity of the galvanometer. Suppose that now you, you want to observe the change. Okay, you want to calculate the current. Suppose that you want to calculate the current by using this. Then, what will be the current sensitivity? See, how much change in the calculated quantity is taking place due to the change in the observable quantity that means theta you are changing something you are you are doing some changes in theta for that much change how much change in i is taking place that will give you the current uh, sensitivity of the galvanometer current uh, sensitivity of the galvanometer okay here yeah this is what the sensitivity and the precision is a different thing yeah. Uh, how much you are uh, reading is differing from the standard value that will give that will show you the precession. Okay. Plus minus of something you write to some value. Okay. 
that is the that is the precession but this is the sensitivity this is the uh, sensitivity you have to know the difference between these things okay here you are you are observing that we are observing the change in the quantity you want to calculate by changing the value of the observable okay here you are changing theta and uh, you are observing the corresponding changes in corresponding changes in charge and current that means how much change how much yeah here uh, suppose that you want you want to define the current sensitivity okay let us go one by one see well, let us go for the exact uh, definition of the current sensitivity or the charge first of all let us take the charge sensitivity you can see this on the slide yeah here these things we define these things uh, by using our uh, earlier formula which we derived in the previous class okay just you write down the formula there q is equal to d by 2 pi c by n a b into theta we will use here we will be using this formula to define charge sensitivity and current sensitivity so first of all let us go for the charge sensitivity we just we call this as q as we put as here what is charge sensitivity according to our sensitivity definition this is q by theta naught q by theta naught q by theta naught this is equal to you are left with d by 2 pi c by n a b this is nothing but according to our previous notation this is k yeah this is k yeah this ratio is called as a charge charge sensitivity how to define this it is nothing but the charge for unit value of theta okay see charge sensitivity is nothing but the change in the charge per unit deflection per unit value of the deflection see what is the definition we define this to be a transient charge required for unit value of the maximum deflection of the ballistic galvanometer okay for unit value of this how much change in this takes place that is known as the that is known as the charge sensitivity of the galvanometer charge sensitivity of the galvanometer okay for a unit change in this maximum deflection okay how much charge is it? what is the change in the q what is the change in the q and what is the value of q okay what is the value of q this is the value of q which can which is able to make maximum one unit of a unit angular deflection unit angular deflection how much charge is needed for the unit deflection that is known as a that is known as the charge sensitivity charge sensitivity one unit of maximum deflection okay right next let us go for the uh, current sensitivity b uh, 2 okay current sensitivity let us call this as bias current sensitivity okay i will write here yeah here you want to get the current huh? you take charge by time this entire factor then you have i s is equal to okay i s is equal to what are the other things left over here and a b theta okay this is i yeah q by time i next i by theta naught is equal to c by n a 
B. We define this I by T gamma R as I S. I S. Okay. What is I S? I by T gamma R. Okay. Current required for one unit of deflection. One unit of the deflection of the galvanometer. Okay. Yeah. You see the current sensitivity here. We here. Another name for this uh, current sensitivity is a uh, figure of merit. We will call this uh, current sensitivity as figure of merit of ballistic galvanometer. What is figure of merit or the current sensitivity? Okay, you can see here the definition in words. The transient current required for unit value of the maximum deflection is known as the current sensitivity of the ballistic galvanometer. Okay. How much current is needed for unit deflection? This current is known as the figure of merit of ballistic galvanometer or current sensitivity of the ballistic galvanometer. See, by using these two relations, these two formulas, by using the definitions of charge sensitivity and the current sensitivity, you may relate those two sensitivities. Okay. Here, this current sensitivity is nothing but C by Okay, M A B times T by 2 pi, C by R T by R 2 pi. So here, just what is this here? Q S is equal to T, otherwise you take this definition. Q S is equal to T by 2 pi, C by N A B. But what is C by N A B? This is nothing but I as current sensitivity. So, what is the relation between current sensitivity and uh, relation between next relation between QS and IS? What is the meaning of this current sensitivity and charge sensitivity of the ballistic galvanometer? See, I am taking the current sensitivity formula. T by 2 pi into C by N A B. Okay. But what is C by N A B? It is nothing but uh, current sensitivity. That's why this is equal to T by 2 pi into current sensitivity. So I am writing here Q S is equal to T by 2 pi into I S. So charge sensitivity is equal to T by 2 pi into current sensitivity t by 2 pi into otherwise I will write here you see here 2 s is equal to t by 2 pi into i s t by 2 pi into charge sensitivity is equal t by 2 pi into i s t by 2 pi into i s this is the relation between the charge sensitivity and current sensitivity of the Ballistic galvanometer. Ballistic galvanometer. Yeah, this will show you uh, the sensitivity means at least in order to go for the one unit of throw, how much current is it? How much current is it? needed or how much a charge is needed. So, we call this as the sensitivity of the galvanometer. Okay. These things, these definitions will show you the sensitivity of the galvanometer. Okay. For how much minimum current or for how much minimum charge, hmm, you, you will be able to get at least one unit of angular deflection of the uh, galvanometer. That will show you the sensitivity of the instrument. Yeah, we are also studied this relation between two types of sensitivities, which you can see on the slide as well. Yeah. Now we are going to study about uh, the damping of galvanometer. Okay. We are going to study about uh, this in very detailed manner. Okay, whenever there is a damping, 
our expression will not give us the correct correct value for the charge flowing through the meter. In order to get the correct charge, correct, in order to get the correct value of the charge flowing through the meter, we have to do some corrections. Okay. For that, you have to know how much damping is taking place. Yeah, we have already studied about this damped harmonic oscillator uh, in mechanics. See, whenever there is no damping, you see in the slide, see the amplitude of the oscillator will be the same. You see the blue line, you take the blue wave, there is no change in the amplitude. The amplitude is same over the time, over the period of time. Okay. You see the other curves, you see the other curves, red and green, okay. What is happening there? If you take this uh, uh, second from bottom curve wave, what is happening to that wave? Its amplitude is gradually decreasing. Yeah, this will give you the damped harmonic oscillator. It is damped, but it is doing, it is still doing some oscillations well, it is doing some oscillations yeah otherwise i will uh, make it large you see here uh, you see here yeah this is a blue use you observe the yeah you observe the blue yeah, blue line on the slide, okay. Yeah, the amplitude is same, amplitude is same over the time. See, this says undamped oscillator. This will give you the undamped oscillator, okay. Here, there is some green thing, green one, underdamped, okay. Underdamped, that means damping is very low. You find here the oscillator will form, but its amplitude is gradually decreasing. Next, if you go for the blue thing, this uh, uh, thing, this is a critically damped, critically damped. Just it is, just it is coming to rest without doing any oscillations, without doing. Okay, this red curve will give you the over damped harmonic oscillator, over damped harmonic oscillator okay it is almost somewhat a straight you see here you see here this is the over damped motion of the oscillator okay here who is the oscillator here here the in a, what is that ballistic galvanometer which object is oscillating coil is oscillating now our oscillator is a rectangular coil it has been damped by two factors. Okay, you know what are those factors, whether it may be due to the air, friction between air and the rectangular coil, or it may be due to the uh, AD currents or the induced EMF within the rectangular coil. Okay, right. Now, let us first go for the causes of this damping. Next, we will go for the corrections for the damping. Yeah, first of all, let us discuss about the dampings, different types of dampings. What are the factors that are damping the uh, free rotatory motion of the rectangular coil? Okay, how many types of uh, factors are there? There are two factors, one mechanical factors second category or the electrical factors, electrical factors. Uh, see, first let us uh, consider the mechanical obstructions. Okay. These are due to, the mechanical damping is due to the viscosity of the medium. Okay. One is the mechanical damping, mechanical <coughs> damping, other thing is electrical damping. Okay, mechanical damping. This, this is what. What is the meaning of this? 
This damping due to is due to the friction between coil and medium. That means say air. As the coil as a coil try to rotate through the air, then what happens? This coil surface is in contact with the air. That's why air is showing some obstruction for its free motion. This is this we call as a mechanical damping. Okay. Why why some media some of some materials are are offering some low damping? Why some materials are offering some high damping? That is due to uh, their viscosity. Okay, that's why we refer, we wrote here as a uh, damping due to the viscosity of uh, air. Okay, viscosity means it is creating the frictional forces. It is offering some friction for the rectangular coil. Okay, yeah, we cannot uh, totally eliminate this, but we, we have to take uh, care that it is uh, sufficiently small. Hmm? So that it will not hinder the motion of the rectangular coil. Okay, this is one type of uh, factor. Okay, mechanical factor. This is what is the next electrical factor. What are the other factors are influencing the rotation of the coil? Electrical factors. Okay. Yeah, second type of damping is a electromagnetic damping. Yeah, why this electromagnetic damping? This is due to this is due to the induced induced EMF in the rectangular coil. Rotating in the external magnetic field. Of course, this external means which is inside of the ballistic galvanometer. This is due to two permanent magnetic poles inside the ballistic galvanometer. This is external to our uh, rectangular coil. That's why we are calling this as external magnetic field. Okay, so our rectangular coil is inside this uh, uniform magnetic field due to the two permanent uh, magnetic poles. See, whenever a current, whenever a coil rotates, moves in the strong magnetic field, some EMF is induced in that coil. Okay, whenever that coil is a closed one. Some induced, some EMF is induced in that coil. In addition to the current flowing through that coil, some additional current will be produced that will that will try to obstruct the motion of the rectangular coil, rectangular coil. Why? Because that motion is itself is creating this induced current. Okay, that's why this induced current try to Obstruct the rotatory motion of the rectangular coil. Okay, what we have to do here? We have to minimize this electromagnetic damping as well. For that purpose, what we have to do? We have to use the frames or the core material cores made up of non-conducting materials. For example, ivory or bamboo, etc. Okay. Yeah. Apart from this factors within the ballistic galvanometer, some other factors outside of these instruments are also causing this electromagnetic uh, damping. See how much uh, electromagnetic damping or the, or the damping current is present in the rectangular coil will also depends on the uh, external circuit in which we are placing this uh, ballistic galvanometer. If 
the external circuit is of very low resistance, then what happens is its magnitude will be very high. Very large induced current will be formed in the rectangular coil when the external circuit is consisting of very low resistance. So that's why when we have very low resistance in the external circuit, the induced current inside the rectangular coil will be very high. Yeah. So we have to reduce this electromagnetic damping as well. Otherwise, it will influence the reading of a ballistic galvanometer. Okay. Now this is about two types of dampings of uh, the rectangular coil of the ballistic galvanometer. Okay. We call this simply as the damping of the ballistic uh, galvanometer. Yeah, next we are going for the next main in topic of today's lecture, damping correction. We know that uh, we cannot uh, avoid these uh, dampings completely. That's why what we have to do now, only one option is to introduce damping correction. Damping correction. Yeah, we have already seen that in one slide, whenever there is a damping, the amplitude of the oscillator is gradually uh, decreasing, gradually decreasing. Okay. Now what we are discussing, damping correction. Damping correction of ballistic galvanometer. Okay. Now, let us consider this as a mean position of the mean position of the uh, mean position of the ballistic galvanometer. Say this is O. Next, uh, yeah. Say suppose that this is the first row of the pointer of the ballistic galvanometer. Theta 1, next we come for the theta 2 here, next theta 3, next theta 4, dash dash dash. Okay. We have like this. We are writing here the successive flows of the pointer on the right and the left of this, lo this line respectively. Okay. 1, 2, 1 on the right, 2 on the left. 3 on the right, like this, we are noting the deflections and throws of the ballistic galvanometer. Why? Because suppose that the first time it is coming up to theta 1, next time it will not come up to theta 1, it will come only up to theta 3. Why? Because damping is there. Its amplitude is going to decrease gradually. Okay, going to decrease gradually. Otherwise, we would have chosen only one point on the right and one point on the left, our uh, oscillator will be doing oscillations all the time across these two points. But this is not possible here. There is some small damping is there. Okay. So, whenever we consider the damping, we gradually reduce the amplitudes of the pointer or the ballistic galvanometer or the rectangular coil. Okay. Right. Yeah, you can see this on the slide as well. Yeah. Now, what people observe is, yeah, what we are assuming here, let the theta 1, theta 2, dash, dash, dash be the successive, successive throws are the swings, successive throws are swings of the ballistic galvanometer. Uh, okay, now I am showing the, those uh, swings on this uh, line. Okay, 
right? Yeah. Now, here on this side, I'm writing to the not. Yeah. Yeah, you, 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 you can see here now. Last point, the last point on the right side is theta naught. What is this theta naught? You are not observing this theta naught. Actually, if if there is no damping at all in the ballistic galvanometer, then your pointer would have more up to theta naught. But there is some damping. That's why your pointer is moving only up to theta one. That you have to note. That you have to note. Yeah, leave that theta naught. Now, let us uh, try to find the ratio between any two successive throws or the swings. Okay, right. If what people observe is that theta one by theta two, to try to find the ratios of successive swings. Next, theta two by theta three. Dash dash dash. You may take any number of ratios between two successive swings that is equal to a constant. What people observe? They always noted this to be a constant. Let us call this constant to be D. Say for example, say, let us say this to be D. D. Okay. Now, what is the name for this uh, D? This is a technical word here describing the motion of the ballistic galvanometer. Here D is called as, here D is called as decrement, decrement. D is called as a decrement. Why? Because as you go from 1 to 2, 2 to 3, what happens? Shortening of the amplitude takes place. That's why we call these ratios as decrement of the ballistic galvanometer. You take any two successive throws, then you always have its value a constant. We call that constant to be D, decrement. We call this D because it is known as decrement. Okay. So you may also define this decrement in some different manner. That is logarithmic decrement. Logarithmic decrement. Logarithmic Okay, logarithmic decrement. Logarithmic decrement. What is logarithmic decrement? It is nothing but the logarithm of decrement D is known as a logarithmic decrement. When you take the logarithm of uh, the existing value D, then it is known as a logarithmic decrement. It is denoted with lambda. It is denoted with the letter lambda. Ah, so, what is lambda? Lambda is equal to log of. I am writing ln means natural logarithm, log base e. ln b means what is this? Log base e d. This is known as the logarithmic decrement of the ballistic galvanometer. So, what are the technical terms we are using here? Decrement and logarithmic decrement. What is decrement? It is nothing but the ratio between any two successive throws of the ballistic galvanometer. Whenever we take log of this d, then we call that entire value logarithmic decrement. Logarithmic decrement lambda. So, what is our lambda? Lambda is equal to ln b or log base e d. Whenever you take this d, the log of this d to be lambda, then what happens to your d? What happens to your d? I will write here. Then, what happens here? d is, e d is equal to D is equal to E power lambda. D is equal to 
e power lambda. So we are using the logarithm uh, identities uh, relating to the logarithms. Then you have e b is equal to e power lambda. D is equal to e power lambda here. Yeah, whenever lambda is equal to log base e b, then d is e to the power of uh, lambda. Right. So this is a relation between lambda and uh, d. We are already defined d to be the ratio between successive angles. So this theta one by theta 2 is equal to theta 2 by theta 3 is equal dash 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 is equal to e power lambda e power lambda right yeah here 1 to 2 corresponds to how how much of the single oscillation theta 1 to theta 2 Whenever the oscillator moves from theta 1 position to theta 2 position, it only makes it only makes half of the total vibration, half of the right to left. Okay, only right to left. If it again comes to the right, then it becomes one complete vibration. So you have only half vibration from theta 1 to theta. 2. Right, for the half of the vibration, we have theta 1 by theta 2 is equal to theta 2 by theta 3 is equal dash 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 is equal to e to the power of lambda. So, for uh, one complete vibration, that means theta 1 to theta 2 and again theta 3, we have theta 1 by theta 3 is equal to how much e to the power of e to the power of for half vibration we have half 2 into half into lambda lambda so on full vibration we have 2 into 1 into lambda that is 2 lambda okay otherwise you may find this by following the alternate method here you may write theta 1 by theta 3 as theta 1 by theta 2 into theta 2 by theta 3 because each one is equal to e to the power of lambda okay here you have that thing then you have theta 1 by theta 3 is equal to uh, e to the power of e to the power of 2 lambda okay now let us go for the theta naught and theta 1. Here on this line theta 1 is the first observed through when there is a damping. What is theta naught? Theta naught, theta naught is a first throw of the galvanometer when there is no damping at all. When there is no uh, damping at all. Okay, now let us try to find the ratio between theta naught and uh, theta 1, theta naught and theta 1. Since theta 1 corresponds 0 to theta 1, it corresponds to quarter of the vibration. So, we will write this uh, theta naught by theta 1, theta naught by theta 1 is equal to e to the power of for quarter vibration 2 into 1 by 4 into lambda that means lambda by 2 e to the power of lambda by 2 so we may expand this as a series one when you expand this in a series this is equal to 1 plus lambda by 2 plus dash 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 some higher order terms will be there. Okay. If we retain only first two terms, then we have theta naught by theta 1 is equal to 1 plus lambda by 2. We are neglecting higher order terms. Okay. Therefore, 
therefore our uh, theta naught will be theta 1 into 1 plus lambda by 2. Actually, in the formula for q, we don't have theta 1. We have only theta naught. Why? Because we neglected all these dampings. We neglected all these dampings and we assumed that we assumed that entire loss in kinetic energy is making the twists in the phosphor bronze wire. Okay. That's why we have only theta naught there in the formula derived in the previous class. It cannot be observed directly why? because we are always uh, having damping. That's why we have to replace theta naught as theta 1, theta 1 into 1 plus lambda by 2. Okay. Therefore, therefore q is equal to uh, t by 2 pi. Okay. Otherwise, you simply write q is equal to what is our previous formula? We derived in the previous class k into theta 1. That means k into what is our theta naught? Theta 1 plus 1 by lambda by 2. So now q can be found as k into theta 1 into 1 plus lambda by 2. But our doubt is how to find lambda. For that, let us take first and 11 throws or swings of the damped harmonic oscillator. Okay. For first and for first and eleventh throws theta one by theta eleven is equal to theta one by theta eleven is equal to e to the power of how much? For theta one by theta three, you have e to the power of two lambda. No? Difference is three minus one two. Here difference is eleven minus one ten. So here you have 10 lambda. You have 10 lambda. So, so if you take log on both sides, log theta 1 by theta 11 is equal to 10 lambda. Okay, 11. This is natural log or even. So what is your uh, lambda now? Therefore, lambda is equal to Okay, what is our lambda now? I will uh, write here lambda is equal to 1, ten, 1 by 10 ln theta 1 by theta 11. Theta 1 by theta 11. So, what is our lambda here? 1 by 10 natural logarithm of theta 1 by theta 11. Okay, here all these rows can be directly observed theta 1, theta 2, okay, except theta naught. Here we are having theta 1 and theta 11, no problem. We can take these deflections, this, the values of these deflections from the experiment and we write down theta 1 and theta 11 values, then we get lambda value, then we substitute theta 1 value, then we write for k of the galvanometer, then we have q. So in this way, we can get the correct value of charge flowing through the circuit by using the ballistic galvanometer. This is only possible when you introduce the correction for the damping in this manner. Okay, By using this formula and this thing, we are able to calculate the correct charge flowing through the circuit. The two transient charge, that charge is due to the flow of transient current. Okay, this is about the damping correction of a ballistic galvanometer. Okay, let us uh, stop with this. Thank you.